Hi, I'm so glad you've joined us today for another study of the great chapters of the Bible. I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. And today we're going to be looking at part two of our study in Hebrews chapter 11, which we've called Heroes of Faith. Uh, we began with about the first 20 or so verses in a previous lesson, uh, and there's so much in this chapter that we didn't get a chance to, to finish it all, but we're going we're gonna to do that today. First, we're going to go through kind of a recap about what we had looked at in the previous lesson. We had considered, even before Hebrews chapter 10, or rather Hebrews chapter 11 and Hebrews chapter 10, how the Hebrew writer had called on these apparently Jewish Christians who were in danger of chucking their faith for the system that they had been more familiar with and more comfortable with since Christianity was beginning to get them persecuted. He called on them to remember what he called the former days. In verse 32, he says, remember the former days and how they had endured great conflicts of sufferings. He said they showed sympathy to the prisoners and they accepted joyfully the seizure of their property. And so he says, remember all this and don't throw away your confidence. In fact, he tells us in, in verse 39, he reminded them that we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. And then he goes on to tell them what faith is all about. Of course, we're familiar with that great definition of faith in the verse in the first verse of Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so we took a quick look at what I call the components of faith, assurance. That is accepting the reality of the things for which we hope and conviction accepting the reality of the things that we have not seen personally. And we do both of these things on a regular basis. We certainly do it uh, with our view towards history. None of us were there when these ancient things were, were done. And yet when we look at the historical writings of, of those who were there and jotted down those things for posterity, uh, we have a conviction that those things occurred as they said they did, even though we weren't there to personally witness those things. But we look towards faith, or we look with faith towards things in the future, things for which we hope, and we have a conviction that those things will happen because we have evidence of things that occurred in the past that drive us and motivate us to have faith in God. We talked also about how as we continue to look further on in Hebrews chapter 11, the early days of faith, when he talked about Abel, who offered a better sacrifice than, than Cain, about Enoch, who we're told in Genesis chapter 5, walked with God, and then God took him, right? Uh, of course, we know about Noah, whom Genesis 6 through 9 tells us not only prepared an ark, but was saved from the ravage of the floodwaters, because he found favor or grace in the sight of God. And by faith, he prepared an ark. He did those things that God said. And this is something perhaps that is going to be, not perhaps, it will be, a continuing theme as we look at these different men and women of faith in chapter 11. They, they simply did what God said. And of course, one of the great monuments of faith is Father Abraham, the Jews' great father, great ancestor. We're told about how he obeyed. In fact, we're told that specifically in verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. And just in a nutshell, it gives us the motivation that faith provides for us to, to do what God says. We're told about how he lived by faith. We're told about how Sarah herself, by faith, received the ability to, to, to conceive and, and bear a child after she was long past childbearing years. In fact, she was barren for her entire life until, until God had given her the gift, as well as Abraham, of a son, the special son. And then we're told about Abraham's great test of faith in offering that son. 
It's told to us in Genesis chapter 22. And Abraham was so convinced that God was going to somehow take care of this, even if he killed his son, his only son. We're told about that often. It was his son, his only begotten son. That even as he had the knife raised, ready to plunge down into his into the body of his son, his only son. Uh, he was stopped by the voice of, we're told, the angel of the Lord. And that voice said, Now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now what a test that must have been. But by faith, Abraham did what he was told, and he passed that test. And then we looked at some of those who followed in the faith or followed in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham. We looked at briefly at, at three great patriarchs of the Jewish ancestry. By faith, we're told, Isaac blessed. By faith, Jacob blessed. By faith, Joseph made mention of the Exodus, giving commands to take his bones to be buried in the promised land. All of these had a conviction of things not seen. And they believed that God would fulfill his promise. In fact, they relied on it. And these men exemplify the truth of Hebrews 11 verse 13, where it tells us, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth because they were looking for something better, that heavenly city whose founder, whose builder and architect is God, it tells us. And then we left off as we came to Moses' mosaic of faith. So let's begin reading in Hebrews 11, verse 23. We're told in Hebrews 11, verse 23, that by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. And we'll stop there for, for now. The first thing that we see as we consider Mosaic, Moses' mosaic of faith is the faith of his parents. His parents' decision to disobey the king and not kill their male child. They were supposed to throw their, their male children in the river because they, the Egyptians saw that the proliferation of the, of the Hebrew multitude was getting too much for them. They were afraid there was going to be an uprising. So they instituted their own form of birth control, which was really just death, killing, killing the males the baby males off. But when they saw that their son was a beautiful child, and maybe there's more to it than just the fact that he was a good-looking kid, there was something more to this, I believe. But they disobeyed. Instead of obeying the decree to kill their child, they hid him for three months before putting him in a small ark in a little basket in the Nile River and and waiting and perhaps hoping that someone would rescue him. Of course, we know the rest of Moses' story. That's exactly what happened. He was rescued and he grew up in, in the house of, household of, of Pharaoh, enjoying all the, 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 the rights and privileges thereof. But we see Moses' choice in verses 24 through 27. It says, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. See, all around Moses were evidences of that culture's strides 
in the arts, in architecture, in knowledge, not to mention the sheer luxury that Moses would have had the, 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 the privilege of growing up in, the, the, the enjoyment of as he grew up as a member of Pharaoh's household. But he rejected it all in order to identify with the people of God. In fact, let's make a quick left to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, the first so-called Christian martyr, uh, Stephen, uh, refers to this and talks about how Moses made his decision, even if that decision was misunderstood by his fellow Hebrews. In Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 22, it says, Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. Now we'll stop there. But we don't know how much Moses really understood about his identification with and later call to uh, f- call for the freedom of his enslaved Hebrew brethren. Exodus, the book of Exodus doesn't tell us that. But here Stephen tells us that Moses at least had some inkling about the fact that that he had something to do maybe with the, the, the betterment of the situation of his of his Hebrew brethren, and they didn't understand that. And he was willing to to side with them, to to join himself or associate with them. And back in Hebrews chapter 11, it reminds us why. We're told in verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Now, there are a couple of important, crucial points about faith in this example. First, it requires a turning back on the world and an embracing of the future, of the promises of God. As we've already seen, we read verse 13 of Hebrews 11, but look at verse 14. Those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, in that passage, it's talking about the the country that, that Abram and his family had left. But the same is true no matter what era we live in. We make our choice to to consider what God promises in the future better than the luxuries and the privileges we can enjoy in the present. And second, it involves consideration that the reproaches of Christ are greater than the riches of the world. Now again, whether or not Moses had a complete concept of the Messiah at this point in his life uh, is doubtful. But it does tell us he was looking for the reward, whatever he believed that reward would be. And that reward was not to be found in the treasures of Egypt. And then we find in Moses' mosaic of faith, not only his choice to identify with his Hebrew brethren, but his work on their behalf. Forty years later, Moses exhibited this faith by not only returning to Egypt, read with me again in verse 27, It says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was unseen. But then he returns, and it says in verse 28, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. When Moses returned to, to Egypt, even though at the beginning he was apprehensive, that story is told to us in Exodus 3 and 4. But he did return. And in spite of Pharaoh's continued obstinacy and his stubbornness to to let God's people go, Moses stuck to his guns. He believed not only in the mission, but in the God who had sent him. 
in that mission. And so he believed that by keeping the Passover, that the destroyer would come and not take those upon, or rather, uh, in whose house the blood had been spread on, on the lintels of their, of their doorway. Uh, and we're told that because of that, the firstborn of all of Egypt died, not only of men, but also of cattle. Then we see how, by faith, they, they walked through a river with a wall of water on either side of them. On dry land, it says. Not through mud, but on dry land. Great miracle of the Old Testament. And when the Egyptians came in after them, well, the wall of water, the walls of water collapsed in on them, and, and they drowned. All of this because of perhaps the, the most important aspect of faith. Moses did these things not only because he had a forward view, but because he simply did what God said. And again, this is faith boiled down to maybe its simplest sense. Faith is just doing what God says. And so in the life of Moses, we see the value of correct decisions, the choices that he made by faith. In fact, it's part of the choices that he encouraged the Israelites to make uh, during some of his final words. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy 30, uh, in some of his final words, as they stood on the plains of Moab, uh, the children of Israel are just about to enter the promised land. Of course, Moses realizes that he's not going to be able to go there with them, but he's able to see it. And he wants them to realize that there are going to be difficulties and hardships once they get to the other side, and there is going to be opportunity or rather temptation to abandon their faith in God. But he, makes, he, he wants them to make the decision now, to be as determined as ever now not to do that. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 15, Moses said, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity, and that I command you today to love Yahweh your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that Yahweh your God may bless you in the land where you were entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you were crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving Yahweh your God, by obeying His voice, by holding fast to Him, for this is your life and the length of their days, that you may live in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Moses pleaded with his people not to forget God. Some of Moses' choices were based upon his outlook and his condition of heart. Even though Often, his, the condition of his heart was imperfect. Other choices were based on a specific revelation of God, such as the keeping of the Passover. But in any case, we can see that Moses was a man of faith, and he demonstrated it in the choices that he made. He put God first so that he could obey God in all things. Back in Hebrews chapter 11, as we continue on, we have several feats of faith recorded for us. Let's read Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 30. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, 
who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword, they went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had promised something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Now there's a lot here. I just want us to, for a moment, consider some of the, the feats of faith that the Hebrew writer brings up. Forty years later still, in verse 30, after the Israelites had left Egypt and wandered the, the wilderness for 40 years, we see that faith is on display as the Israelites, under Joshua's command, Enter the promised land. He says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And when you go back and you read about that instance in, in, in the book of Joshua, you find that it's not because the Israelite army was so good. In fact, what kind of a battle plan is marching around the city several times for several days and then finally on the last day blowing trumpets and shouting and the city walls fall? No, it wasn't because of them. It was because of God. And we're reminded here of Rahab herself, who is told to us, by faith, Rahab did not perish. Now this is significant because Rahab is a Gentile woman. And what's even more significant is that she is recorded in the book of Matthew, the very first chapter, as an ancestress of Jesus, the Messiah. Well, she admitted that she believed in Almighty God. In fact, it's one of my favorite passages in, in the book of Joshua. Let's just go back there for a moment. Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 2, as Rahab speaks to the men who were sent to spy out the city of Jericho, she says in verse 9, I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how Yahweh drawed up, or dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you, for Yahweh your God, he is God in heaven above, and on earth beneath. Now, if that's not a statement of faith, I don't know what is. After that, Rahab appealed to the spies and, and asked them to, to please somehow save her family. And, and they told her that if she hung a, a scarlet or a red cord from, from her window, that those in her household, or at least those with her in her house, would be saved. And she believed it. And by faith, Rahab did not perish. And then as we go back to Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrew writer says, What more shall I say? In verse 32. And then he rattles off a, lists of, a, a, a list of various names and deeds, all displays of faith that were evidenced, that evidenced their trust in God and their willingness to obey him, even if it meant that they themselves would suffer for it. And it's interesting to me, when he, when he talks about, in verse 32, he speaks of Gideon, of Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel and the prophets. He speaks of three great historical periods, the time of the judges, the time of the monarchy, and the time of the prophets. Now, when he mentions Gideon, we're just going to, talk about a few of these. We don't have time to talk about them all. But Gideon's story is told to us in Judges chapter 6 through Judges 8, and it reminds us of the reduction 
of his fighting force from 32,000 men down to 300. The idea is that he had to rely on his faith in God. He had to rely on the might of God and not the might of his army because he didn't have much of an army. And yet, they defeated the Midianites. King David, whose story is told to us in 1 Samuel 15 through the end of 2 Samuel, although he was a flawed man, is called a man after God's heart. And it's evident why. Because of, in spite of, of, of David's frequent failings, he was a steadfast follower and lover of God. He believed in him. He trusted in him. And he had to. Because David couldn't trust in himself. He was just a man like you and I. And a weak man at that. Samuel, we're told, who was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, whose story is told to us in 1 Samuel 1-25, through was a man of fierce faith. A man who often spoke truth to power. A man who was steadfast to the word of God. A man who lived to make sure that others obeyed God. And then we're given this great list of unnamed in verses 33 through through 38. And they include for us examples of, of physical defeat, even though they had spiritual victory. Now, some of them are difficult to identify, but we can see allusions to, to certain men. Maybe in, in at the end of verse 33, those who, he says, shut the mouths of lions. Immediately our mind goes to, to Daniel in the lion's den, a man who from a young boy all the way to his death, just exhibited great faith in God, no matter the consequences. In verse 34, those who quenched the power of fire. Maybe the Hebrew writer is thinking about the three men, the three Hebrew boys in the, the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are, of course, their Babylonian names. But they were spared from being burned to death because there was another one in the fire with them. You remember that story? We're told about widows, uh, women in verse 35, who received back their dead by resurrection. Maybe it's speaking of the Zarephath and the Shunammite widows who through the prophets Elijah and then later Elisha received back their dead sons who were restored to them. In effect, uh, again, the idea there is significant that, that they were Gentile women as, as well. Uh, others that may be alluded to uh, here in, oh, let's see, verse uh, uh, verse 36, those who experience mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment. Uh, Jeremiah certainly was one of those who experienced uh, a lot of persecution for his willingness to speak truth to the people in spite of the fact that they didn't want to listen to him. Isaiah maybe is the one who's referred to as it says in verse 37, they were sawn in two. Now, if Jewish tradition is to be trusted, uh, Isaiah is the one whom it's spoken about. Isaiah, it said, was sawn in two and given a chance to recant the prophecies that he had spoken against the people, but he refused to do it, choosing rather to be true to what God's word said than to even save his own neck, to save his own life. And again and again, we see where this is a reminder that faith doesn't guarantee physical safety, but it acts on the con- or, or the confidence of a better future in spite of a, of a maybe even horrific present. And the writer closes out this section by saying that these were men of whom the world was not worthy. And all of these, he says, they've gained approval through their faith. Exactly, exactly, they gained approval through their faith. And that's why God has promised them a better country, and us as well, so that those who gain approval will receive the promised reward. Look with me again at verses 39 and 40. It says, And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. And that tells us two things at least. One is that the promise made to them was spiritual. It wasn't necessarily going to be fulfilled in this life. 
And second, that that spiritual reward is theirs as well as ours to reap together through Christ. This hall of faith that gives us this great, great list of all these heroes is a hallowed hall indeed. Those who lived lives of faith lived courageous lives. And they had to, since the world was, and still is, adamantly opposed to God and His Christ. But those who were His, at least while in this world, are not of this world. Because like those who we read about in Hebrews 11, we look to a better country. The country whose builder and founder, whose architect, is God. Now, the fact that we look for something beyond this world creates a, a tension that Christians in the present age need to deal with. We need to recognize where it is our allegiances and our priorities lie. Are we willing to bask in the luxuries of this present world without thinking of the promises of the one to come? No. If we learn anything from this great hall of faith, it's that the heroes are not necessarily these people. The real hero in Hebrews 11 is God. He's the one we place our trust in. He's the one able to deliver on His promises, even in spite of our weaknesses and our failings. God is the hero in this great hall of faith because He is the object of faith. There's so much more that we could look at in Hebrews chapter 11, but I thank you for joining us. And I hope you've gotten the chance to take a look at the first lesson, part one, of this great chapter of the Bible. Well, we'll see you again with another installment of great chapters of the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.